Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we are going to talk about textbooks and how I go through them and how we're going to be ranking them moving forward and how you should think about textbooks when you start to consider buying textbooks and also why you don't need a lot of textbooks. Um, so let's just dive on in here. So to start off with here, I think the most critical piece to kind of start with and think about is how to look at how I select textbooks, how I kind of rank them. Here's where we're gonna be moving forward. And the number one criteria here is going to be scope. So when you look at textbook scope, uh, it ranges from very general uh, to extremely specialized. And most of you will never read a specialized book in any sort of graduate program. You'll cover something towards the middle, but realistically, you're not gonna really end up in this specialist zone. I'm gonna mention a few textbooks here again, which are used in some grad schools, and they're starting to get more towards the specialty end of it, but you can always get more specialized. And so when you start off with here in a new field of study, you're wanting to learn quantitative finance and whatever that means, uh, it's typically best to start off with general books. So books that are just very general, books that are gonna cover a lot of just different topics. These are the sort of books though that you cover in undergrad. And then as you move towards grad school, um, they should become more and more specialized. And then as you work in the industry, if you want to become an actual expert in a field of study, you have to start looking for books that are just specialty books that are very, very, very niche on a very, very specific topic here. So let's give a few examples here as I talk about these and I'll talk about some of the other categories here on ranking books. Um, an example though of like a generalist book, so you're wanting an example, is Linear Algebra and its Applications by Gil Strang. Um, again, an awesome book, a fun book, really enjoyable book to read in my opinion. But linear algebra is super general. It can be applied to almost anything. It can be applied to quant finance, as we talked about, statistics, uh, engineering, all sorts of mathematical modeling problems. Like linear algebra is very general and it has a lot of applications. And I know many people say, Dimitri, I don't care about the generals. I just want to get specialized. You cannot go from nothing to specialized. You have to start with generalist books. And this is what separates real quants and real academics and those that are just really experts and really involved in the theory and the process is that they understand the fundamentals, the general textbooks, and they've worked their way into the more interesting applied topics here. So this is a perfect example of this. Again, all the calculus books, all the math books I recommended in the other video, which I'll link above or below on, you know, sort of classes and topics you should take as an undergrad. These should all be generalist courses here. Now, again, another book, which I would consider a generalist book, is going to be an introduction to statistical learning with applications in R here. So this is a very popular book. Um, it's by James Witten, Hasty, and Tib Sharani. Uh, again, it's a different topic. It's not linear algebra. Uh, it's statistical learning, but this is a very generalized book. It is a introduction book. And finally, another specific book. So again, another topic, another area, but I would consider a very generalist book is going to be Derivatives, Principles and Practice by Sundaram and Das. Um, I really like this book. This is more like a business kind of perspective review on derivatives. Um, it doesn't get into a lot of really heavy math or theory or like why it's important and things that break down. Um, but again, this is another generalist book. So you can take financial engineering, which is derivatives, uh, or quantitative finance as a whole, and you can have generalist books. And most of you are going to be reading generalist books because that's where you start off in a career here. Now, as we start going across the spectrum, we start to get a little bit more specialized. Uh, I would argue analysis of financial time series uh, by say, so I've really enjoyed reading this book. I'll do a book review on this eventually. Uh, it's starting to get more specialized. You're starting to really see applications specifically uh, to quantitative finance, financial applications, but it's really teaching time series, which is statistics. So we're taking statistical and mathematical theory and properties that you should have learned in more of your generalist books here. And then we're starting to apply them into a financial framework into another setting here. So we're taking more or less like some general topics which would be like you know linear algebra, uh, PDEs, ODEs, mathematics, like calculus and whatnot, uh, and kind of putting all this together with probability theory and statistical theory and applying it to finance. Now, again, I would consider this like a middle of the road application. It's not super, super specialized, but it's getting there. This is like a middle of the road book. It's not general, but it's not real specialized, it's kind of that middle road of what a lot of people are comfortable in learning. And that's completely fine if that's where you want to stop. Um, a better book though, I think which is a little bit more applied, a little bit more specialized, is going to be Monte Carlo Methods in Financial Engineering by Paul Glasserman. 
So this is a fairly popular book as well. But this book in itself is getting more focused. It is going to be uh, looking at Monte Carlo methods, which is one just type of thing. Like many students learn something general like Monte Carlo and they go, okay, I know it all. And then I pull out a book and I'm like, oh, okay, well, here's a whole book on Monte Carlo methods uh, just for financial engineering applications. And again, you can see uh, the book itself in total pages, excluding all the appendices and all that is 537 pages. So again, this is getting there, but you could even write a book probably just on one chapter in this to give you kind of an understanding of what this book looks like, because this is a you know middle, a little bit more towards the specialized spectrum of this. Let's say maybe like a three and a half to four out of a five star scale here. Uh, it's going to be on foundations, then it's generating random numbers and random variables, generating sample paths, and then it's going to get into variance reduction techniques, quasi Monte Carlo, discretization methods, estimation, estimating sensitivities, uh, pricing American options, applications, and risk management. So those are the big categories or the big chapters. Again, I work in risk management. We, I could write probably an entire book on applications and only on credit risk uh, doing Monte Carlo simulations and why that's absolutely critical. Now, again, that would be on the very specialized end of the spectrum here. So when you're looking to purchase a textbook, I think the scope of the book is the most critical piece here. What are you wanting to learn? Um, where are you at in your journey on that topic here? It makes absolutely no sense to buy something that's a super advanced book. So as an example, one of the biggest mistakes I see people do, uh, time series is really fun and exciting, and we'll do a video on my time series books that I really enjoy. Um, there's this book called Time Series Analysis by uh, Hamilton, so James D. Hamilton. It is considered like, I don't know, the Bible of time series by most people. Do not buy this book if you're just starting out. It is huge. It is extremely mathematical. If you do not have a strong math background, so again, all of those prerequisite courses here, this book makes no sense. And I will make a video on time series books on the three I think that are good as a very, very beginner introductory book, um, a middle tier book, which is that say book. And then finally, this book, which would be like the specialist book on this topic and field here. But you need to find the book that is right for you. And you need to kind of look at the scope here. Where are you at in that journey? And where do you want to start on that topic here? And you might be starting in a generalist position, for example, maybe in finance, and then you might be on a more intermediary to advanced topics on like mathematics. Um, that kind of helps you kind of gauge to where you need to be studying at and where you need to kind of you know, shore up your weaknesses here, uh, is looking at the scope. Now, the other areas I look for in textbooks here is going to be topics covered. Uh, and this ties in somewhat directly with the general to specialty piece of this. Books that cover a wide range of topics are going to be generalist books. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but just realize as you're reading the book, you're not going to know a lot of depth and insight and applications because they'd have to make a book like, I don't know, a foot or more wide just to be able to get all the different, you know, detailed applications of this. Um, but look at the topics covered as well. So when I purchase textbooks, if there's a specific area, like one topic I really want to know a lot about, I'll open up uh, the table of contents online, look at the book, see what areas it covers. And I'm like, okay, it covers these two areas I really wanted. And then I'm like, oh, there's this other chapter, this other section, which is really interesting as well. And so I try to make sure the topics covered in the textbook uh, are topics that I'm interested in and that are going to be covering kind of areas that I'm missing. And so that's how I start to kind of select textbooks to buy in general as I go through the scope and the topics being covered in there. Um, other pieces here, which I will be covering in the textbook reviews are going to be readability. So easy to hard. Again, there's going to be some specialty involved in this. Like if you're brand new to the field, uh, so a generalist book, that should be easier to read. But also there's just authors who write very poorly. And so the readability is quite low. Um, so readability is kind of independent of this. I will try to separate out um, the scope of the book against the readability. So if you are getting a book that is super specialized, I'm going to assume you're gonna have, um, again, that level of knowledge and depth to read it. But readability is going to be just how good the author writes. So in uh, Gil Strand's book, his linear algebra book, um, I absolutely love his writing style. I feel like he's like me. Like I write really informally and I'm like, I'll say, I said this and I said that and you should do this, that and the other. And I like talk about it like we are having a conversation. Um, that's how this book for me comes across. And I think that's how the book comes across for many other people. And so for readability, this is a really good example. I think a really easy readability. Um, the other piece is going to be examples. So people ask, Dimitri, how do you read a textbook? Um, I typically read them from beginning to end. 
Um, if I'm looking just to cover a lot of topics, a lot of areas, things I'm just not very familiar with, I don't even know where to start. Start at the beginning of a textbook that looks interesting and work your way to the end of it. Most textbooks are written um, in chronological fashion, which I know seems kind of weird because it's not a story. Uh, but when you look at books like I have uh, uh, The Introductory to Econometrics, A Modern Approach by Jeffrey Waldridge. This is one of my other favorite books. He starts off going through things like, why do we need models? Why do we need econometrics? And then he starts going into like OLS, which is really, really simple estimation procedure. Uh, it's very, very simple uh, model within itself. And then he starts building on top of all these failed assumptions and he starts layering the topics one on top of another. Um, the same goes for math books. Like if you pick up uh, like a calculus book, right? Like the, uh, the calculus book I mentioned before by James Stewart here, so just calculus. Again, it covers calculus one, two, and three. So if you just jump in in the middle, you're gonna be somewhere in calculus two, or if you jump towards the end, you're gonna be in calculus three. You're going to need all those intermediary steps here. Now, if you already took, for example, um, some of the topics at the beginning of the book, then I'll just jump into a specific chapter in a specific section here. So I bought, um, I don't think I have it with me, but I bought a textbook and I was like, I really need to get into this one topic. I had this one interest here. And so I just bought the textbook, found the chapter I needed, and then I just dove right into the middle of the textbook. Now you can do that because you can kind of review the table of contents at the beginning and see, oh, I've covered kind of these topics and materials. Now, again, the author is going to have their own viewpoint. There are things covered that you probably have not covered, like parts of it. So they're reteaching it from a different angle or perspective. But I like to just dive in if I need just a specific topic or a specific interest. Um, the calculus book is a perfect example. Maybe you've taken Calc 1 and 2, and then you can kind of look through the topics and the chapters and go, okay, I've covered all this, and then jump right in where you think more or less like, you know, Calc 3 would start. Uh, then I kind of just dive in on one spot and I buy that textbook. And that leads me to the next piece here of how I rank textbooks, which is going to be examples. So I absolutely love textbooks that have examples. If you have a lot of number of examples, so a high number of examples here, and there are some solutions in the back of the text, or what you can do what I do, uh, I go on Google and I try to find the solutions manual. That is even better because again, a lot of examples help you really churn through the problem. They they make you struggle with the ideas a bit. And I don't think it's beneficial to just jump to the solution. So I read textbooks extremely slow. Uh, when I do book reviews, I read them much quicker. It's not for the same sake as learning in depth as I would uh, for a topic that I'm just like really enthralled with and like excited I need to know more about or I'm using it for work, then I wanna know every detail possible. Um, but for textbook reviews, I read them a little bit quicker. But for actual learning, I go through and I read the chapter and I look at the example problems. And yes, I skip some of them. I'm not gonna do every single problem, but I look at them and I pick out a few to go through and I really think about them. And if I get stuck, I do it just like I do at school and I just stop. And I think about it for a day or two and then I'll try to come back and work through that example again. And then if not, I'll think about it maybe a second time and think about it, you know, look online maybe this time, Google a few different perspectives of it. Again, not searching for the answer. Like I don't just need the answer to the problem. I want to know like how it's solved. So I'm trying to solve it myself by kind of doing my own research. And there's nothing wrong with using the internet. Uh, just be weary, there's a lot of fake nonsensical information out there. Um, but I do that. And then finally I check the answer and I'm like, okay, I stuck on the problem. I couldn't figure it out. I need the solution here. Or maybe I think I have the problem and I've solved it and I want to check the solution. Um, that gives you a gauge of how well you have learned the material here. So examples, the more examples you have, the more resources you have to kind of find the answers to those examples. Those are usually better textbooks. Um, textbooks that have almost no examples, you get what you get. Uh, I think they're just hard to work with. They don't make you really think abstractly about kind of the problems here, trying to apply it to something new. And I think that's the advantage of having examples in textbooks. So I also look for textbooks with those examples. And that's also how I read. I read sections and parts and I look at some of the examples they provide in the text. So sometimes they have like a, you know, a general problem and I don't fully understand it. Like they do the proof really quick. Um, if you really want to learn it, then you need to go online or find another textbook and kind of figure out, you know, okay, I don't understand the proof. How do we get from A to Z? And what steps in the middle there are we missing? Uh, and then try to fill in your knowledge gaps as you go. Because if you do that, it will take you much, much longer to read the textbook, but you will actually understand that material much better. And then as you progress through textbooks, for example, um, it's easier and easier because you have all the fundamentals that the author assumes you have because you've covered the previous chapters. And then finally here, um, 
The other three kind of pieces of the textbook reviews I'm going to be doing here is going to be value. So low value and high value. I found a few publishers I just really like. Uh, they have book sales often, which makes the value better, uh, or they're just cheaper books. So they try to you know, add value in here and there, and they try to make it a more valuable book. I do like to consider value because I don't like to spend 100 to 200 to 250, $300 sometimes on a textbook, and it's super specialized. And then I realize it's too specialized for me, or it's just not written very well, or, you know, I don't know, it's just not interesting to me anymore, like the topic itself. So I try to take value into consideration as well. You want good quality books, so good quality information, explanations, uh, readability, all scope and all that. Um, but you want to make sure that you're getting good value out of the textbook as well. And then we have purpose. So different textbooks have different audiences in mind here. So I have my purpose scale set up from high school to undergrad to grad. Um, I should probably put like one more tier being industry practitioner here. Um, but there should be some sort of scale or target or purpose for that book. Like who is it made for? If this textbook is made for a graduate level course and you're reading it in high school, it's gonna be a big waste of your time because you're not going to have all the courses and the background information to read that sort of textbook. So it kind of ties into the scope here. But looking at what's the purpose of the book, who is it targeted towards, that's going to be a big factor in if you should buy the textbook or if maybe you should look for other textbooks which might help you get towards you know that kind of level of understanding and you know those sorts of topics. And then finally, I do a final overall stars rating where I try to weight all these together and come up with a one to five star. If it is a one, it is a terrible book. If it is a five, it is an excellent book. And then I try to wrap this up with a summary of who is this book for? And that's what this video is intended to cover here is trying to look at textbooks and the fact that that's the way I cover textbooks as I go from beginning to end. I look at the examples and the chapters and then also making sure you're purchasing the right textbooks. Like who is this book actually for? If this textbook is not for you, if it is not targeted towards you, it's not going to be of much value to you because when an author writes a textbook, uh, they think a lot about the prerequisites because they cannot cover every sort of information in great, great depth to cover somebody, for example, from undergrad or even high school all the way through a graduate or an industry level of understanding. So try to find the textbooks that are relevant for you. Um, that's how I rank textbooks. That's how I study and read textbooks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.